meeting is being recorded. Pat, did you want to test the uh, share screen again and get it set up? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'll do that real quick, Kendall, thanks.
Okay. Did you share your application, Pat? How's that look? The meeting is yes, fine. that looks good. I it can looks see good the courtroom too. Thank you. Perfect. If it's set up this way, then I can just stop presenting and click back on, and it'll be ready to go. Yes, that should be exactly what you need to do. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem.
We want uh, individual presentations on the um, on the um, regulatory asset orders. Okay. Whatever works best. So just go as we normally go on. on okay. Um, I think I'm, I might have questions. We'll okay. And then you know make some edits. Okay. okay. So I'll just do like I always do and open it to questions. Okay. <clears throat> It is 9.13 on March 18th. We'll call the uh, meeting to order. All three commissioners are present in the courtroom, and if each would announce themselves, Todd Hyatt is present in the courtroom. Commissioner Anthony present. Dana Murphy present. 
And there is a quorum present, and notice is appropriate. And I'll ask the acting secretary, Ms. Leatherrock, to call the, I mean, to um, announce today's agenda. Good morning, commissioners. On today's agenda for Thursday, March 18th, 2021, submitted for your vote are the following proposed orders. 31 CDs, two ENs, three PDs. As a note, PD 2020-158 was posted twice. One of those should have been PD 2020-159, citation oil and gas exception to the rule. Since this is a daily item, I would just look to you for whether you want to consider it today or have it reposted on a future date. I'm fine with uh, moving forward. Others? Okay, we'll just move forward with it. All right, thank you, Kendall. Are there uh, none to be stricken? Did you announce? No, okay. Thank you, Kendall. Are there questions of the commissioners on the daily agenda? Seeing no questions, Kendall, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Hyatt? Aye. Commissioner Anthony? I vote aye. Commissioner Murphy? Aye. All right, we'll move to the 24 hour agenda. We'll dispense with individual presentations unless there are specific questions of the commissioners. I don't know if there are any comments or questions on um, any of the telecom matters, but I do have a, a question, hopefully for uh, Mr. Humes on the 2021-39 cause, and I have some I have some edits uh, to offer on the 2021-50 Empire District Electric. And I think there might have been also some edits suggested by Commissioner Anthony's office on the cause I want to ask questions about, which is 2021-39. Ms. Hume, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Uh, Commissioner, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Okay, thank um, you. Mr. Hume, I guess my question really goes to, um, on page 4, of five, the last sentence in the first kind of partial paragraph says all such costs will be subject to prudence review in this proceeding or in a future proceeding. And then the very last paragraph says that this proceeding shall remain open to undertake a prudency review of fuel and wholesale energy costs. So could you just kind of explain, I don't know that it conflicts, but could you just explain um, how the language works between that paragraph and the one at the end, please? Uh, yes, Commissioner Murphy. I think this is uh, an instance where the parties worked over and over this order so much, we knew what we thought we were trying to do, but it wasn't apparent to us looking back that a cold read might show some conflict. Let me address what the intent of the parties uh, was in this order. Uh, we wanted the, this cause or docket to remain open with the idea that most likely the prudence and methodology regarding recovery of these extraordinary winter storm event costs would be determined in this cause at a later date, sometime later this year. However, we wanted some optionality in case another cause, like a rate case or maybe the yearly fuel prudence review was filed, and others thought that perhaps these costs were best considered in that context as opposed to this standalone docket, there would be the option to do that. In other words, you could close this cause and take up the, the extraordinary cost recovery and prudence in a different cause if that was necessary. Okay, I think that explains, uh, I, I don't know that I saw a conflict, but I was a little confused about what it meant, and I think you were right um, about just looking at a cold read. So I don't think I have any other questions on the order, and. Um, Commissioner Anthony's office made some suggestions on the language, and I don't know, Commissioner Anthony, if you want to talk about those, but I'm going to be supportive of those. I think they speak for themselves, and uh, thank you. 
Okay, so I'll, I'll just go ahead and note, Commissioner Hyatt, the, the change that's noted at the bottom of the page uh, on page three, carrying over to page four, would be similar. I have the red line version of what we did in the ONG order where it has requested for consideration. Just to make it clear, we're not, it's not really a pre-approval. It's what was requested in the application, and these are going to be the types of things to be looked at. So I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of that adjustment. I'm supportive of as well. Does Peggy have the, the final? Not Peggy. I mean, Kendall. Does Kendall have, have a clean draft? All right. And Commissioner Hyde, if you want me to go ahead and move on to um, the 2021-50 Empire. Yes, please do. Okay. Um, on the 2021-50, I have provided the other offices with just a few edits. Uh, one was in the header that's on um, that puts the cause number in the additional edits would go on page three of four and again it would line up with some of the things that we did um, in the ONG matter and also what we just did in the OG&E um, order so on paragraph the first full paragraph on page three, the third full paragraph, I'm sorry, on page three, it would read, the commission further finds the extraordinary cost to be thus deferred to a regulatory asset and requested for consideration at a future time include, and then it would have the numbers, and then down at the very end of that paragraph, it would say, any such costs will be subject to a prudence review in a future proceeding prior to collection from ratepayers. So those are the those are the changes I would suggest to the other offices and it would it would sort of sync up what we've done in, in the majority of these orders now. I'm supportive of those changes. And if Mr. Tillotson is on the phone, I did just have a general question it, it, uh, about SPP related costs. It caused me to go back and and do my own little review to um, understand because I know that in the OG&E order there was a reference also to SPP cost and this commission has dealt with those a lot. It's my understanding that all transmission related costs flow through rate cases and then there are other costs that actually flow through uh, the fuel adjustment clause or what some people refer to as FAC. So, Mr. Tillotson, could you address just the SPP costs that are set forth in that same paragraph that I, I just suggested the edits to? Sure, Commissioner. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. So, those, the, my understanding is that all of the costs that are listed in that paragraph under item four are SPP market charges. And uh, as you know, there's quite a few different uh, SPP market charges. And my understanding after speaking with our experts at the company is that all of the charges contemplated by uh, that paragraph would flow through our FAC. And so those are normal charges that would, would flow through that uh, fuel adjustment clause. Uh, they just are expected to be significantly higher as a result of this, this winter storm. Okay, and I think my second question was, I noticed that the detail wasn't really in the OG&E order, but it was my understanding, I think, from uh, what I discovered that there was a request from the Attorney General's office to have some more detail in number four. Is that accurate? Yes, I think that's accurate, Commissioner. We originally had um, that a little broader possibly and, and in speaking with uh, uh, Mr. Haynes uh, there was a request that we uh, include some more detail about what charges we were contemplating being included in that regulatory asset and so we tried to give as much specificity as we could to that so that uh, we are completely transparent and uh, everybody's on the same page with what we're contemplating go uh, what we are contemplating goes into that regulatory asset. Okay, I don't think I have any other questions, and I know Mr. Long was also on this case as well, but I, I'm just kind of going with his analogy that he gave us, I think, last week about 
the parking lot and the different types of costs kind of going into different um, items and then there'll be the prudence review and then the orders all set out that there wouldn't be any um, uh, any efforts to seek collection from the ratepayers until there's been a prudence review. So that's been my general understanding and that's how I'm proceeding and I don't have any additional questions on these. And thank you for being available, Mr. Tillotson. Thank you, Commissioner. Any further questions of the commissioners on the 24-hour agenda? And Kendall, you do have the final version on um, 21-50. Yes, Commissioner. Okay. All right, seeing no further questions, Kendall, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Hyatt? Aye. Commissioner Anthony? Aye. Commissioner Murphy? Aye. We'll turn to agenda item number four, um, the rulemaking 21-1, uh, be the chapter 20 rules. Mr. Copeland, are you on the line? Yes, sir. All right. Please proceed. Good morning. Michael Copeland for the Transportation Division. Pursuant to the Oklahoma Administration uh, Administrative Procedures Act, this is the public hearing for proposed changes to chapter 20 of the Oklahoma Administrative Code. Chapter 20 is the rules for gas and hazardous liquid pipeline safety and should be noted as commission cause number RM 2021 <clears throat> Over the last few months, the transportation division has contacted the industry and had a few small group meetings, a technical conference, and has requested written comments from industry participants. After receiving comments, revisions to the original proposed rules that were filed on February 2nd, 2021 were made. The revised proposed rules were filed on February 23rd, 2021, and finally revised and filed again on March 12th, 2021. The proposal before you today is an industry compromise that we believe should be adopted today by the commission. Before public comment is allowed, for those joining us via Scopia, if you would like to be included on the sign-in sheet for Chapter 20 rules, please send your contact information to me, Michael Copeland, at michael.copeland at occ.ok.gov. That's M-I-C-H-A-E-L dot C-O-P-E-L-A-N-D at occ.ok.gov. After, after public comments are heard, if the commission is inclined, I have a motion prepared to present you for consideration. I would also like to announce that Dennis Fothergill, Program Manager of the Pipeline Safety Division, is available with me today to answer questions if necessary. Thank you. Questions of Mr. Copeland on the Chapter 20 rules. I see no questions. Mr. Copeland, would you, would you uh, state the motion for us? Yes, sir. I ask the commission to make a motion to adopt the proposed rules as filed on March 12, 2021, incorporating in the record the ensuing rule report, any comments and documents filed with the court clerk regarding the rulemaking. I further ask that the commission allow me to make any changes necessary to be compliant with the requirements of the Office of Administrative Rules. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Copeland. Are there, are there any... Um that uh, on the line that would like to make public comment on the Chapter 20 rules, 2021-1. Hearing no public comment, um, we have the motion before us. We ready to vote? All right, Ms. Leatherrock, would you call the roll? Commissioner Hyatt? Aye. Commissioner Anthony? Aye. Commissioner Murphy? Hi, and I wanted to just express my appreciation to, I know Mark's not available, but um, for his efforts and working with Dennis and uh, uh, Michael and others to make some of these additional changes for March 10th, I think it was uh, a good compromise, so I appreciate all the efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Copeland. All right, agenda item number five will be 2021-2, be the chapter five rules. 
it's my understanding that uh, Ms. Willingham has a lot more important things happening right now, so uh, I will turn to uh, Mary Beth. Ms. Snap, are you on the line? Are you presenting today for Ms. Willingham? I, well, I am presenting the Chapter 5 rules today. You truly have Plan B, which I think is Plan Baby today. <laughs> yes. So, um, can you hear me all right? We can hear you. Okay. So, good morning. This is Mary Beth Snap for the Judicial Legislative Services Division. And we're here today for the public hearing in the Chapter 5 rulemaking proceeding in cause number RM 2021-00002. Over the past several months, the JLS division has conducted numerous industry and small group meetings and held two formal technical conferences concerning these rules. Further, the opportunity for written comment was provided. We received one written file stamped comment from industry. The proposal before you today is a compromise that we believe should be adopted by the commission. And before public comment is allowed, for those joining us in Scopia, if you would like to be included on the sign-in sheet, please send your contact information to me at marybeth.snap at occ.ok.gov. That's M-A-R-I-B-E-T-H dot S-N-A-P-P at After public comments are heard, if the commission is inclined, I have a motion prepared to present for your consideration. Thank you. First, are there questions of the commissioner? Okay. Mary Beth. I'm sorry, yes, sir. Were you trying to say something? Well, I was going to say, do you wish us to go through the whole chapter rule by rule, or do you want to simply take co public comments? I or think uh, I think let's start with questions of the commissioners and then move to uh, public comment. I don't, uh, unless my colleagues would like to, I don't see that we have we have it in front of us. I don't see that we need to go item by item. Okay. Agree. Are there questions of commissioners? I do have a question. Uh, on page 14 of 22. Yes, sir, that's the rule regarding the um, expansion of a certificate of means and necessity to provide local exchange telecommunication services. Yes, and the, uh, the language, it's mid-paragraph, uh, to meet the above statutory notice requirements notice by electronic mail be sent to a central entity consisting of political sub subdivision, including but not limited to uh, dot, dot, dot. Can you explain how that, it, it appears to me that that's in conflict with statute. And I know we've had this conversation before. Can you explain to me once again how that would be in line with statute? Done with the industry. And the first thing is to try and get it by electronic mail. If mail were to be done by postal mail, there would be almost 1,200 political entities to send mail to if they were seeking a statewide authority. And so in an effort to try and interpret the statute in a way that does not create a barrier to entry, um, for a CCN application for a local exchange service. This was determined to be a way to try and get them information out that everybody needs. Now, obviously, there's still going to be publication in the newspaper, but this was an attempt to try and streamline the process for providing notice. So political subdivision is not defined in the statute, and so this was an effort to um, simplify, if you will, the notice requirement. Okay. It, the statute uh, says providers shall give notice by mail or personal service to each regional council as defined in the local and regional capital improvement planning process act 
I, I have struggled with this, and I know we've we've discussed this before, and I've I've uh, gone along with it, but I I do struggle, and I I don't know that I disagree with your your logic, and it may be that we need um, to address this across the street uh, to make it more um, user friendly. Um, are there other thoughts of uh, commissioners on? Um, I will. I appreciate the question from Commissioner Hyatt, and um, I understand Mary Beth the uh, intent, but I don't think it's for this commission to interpret that mail means electronic mail. Because if that was done, that could be applied. Every agency might be trying to apply that across the board to every statutory provision. So. I think I mentioned at the beginning, and it was my understanding that the Oklahoma Municipal Authority was seeking to have some language changed. I thought they were moving forward on it this uh, session with Mike Fina. So while I appreciate the intent, I, I don't think it follows the statute because I don't think it's for the commission to decide that mail in the statute equals electronic mail. I, I, I don't think we can do that from a legal standpoint. So I won't be supportive of this. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Snap, um, I have followed this uh, issue and I think there's uh, some interpretation, but it's uh, your position and as an attorney and your position as uh, representing staff that uh, you recommend this uh, rulemaking at this time. Is that right? That is correct, sir. Thank you. I'm happy to uh, sponsor the motion for approval uh, when it's uh, appropriate after any further discussion. Mayor Beth, what, what would happen if we struck subsection D? If you strike subsection D, the statute prevails as the methodology for giving notice for expansion of a CCNN, and the party was going to interpret how to do that best themselves. I think that there has been a motion or two filed in CCNN applications seeking that the commission on a case-by-case -case basis determine how notice should be given, and that has the option of um, continuing in the future. Okay. That would be the direction that I would propose, is that we strike subsection D and continue as we have and, and until we can get legislative um, action to to update the statute. Could could you further reference what page and... I'm sorry, it's page 14 of 22. It's the uh, um, part five, subsection D. I think we have it up there on the screen. Oh, yes, you do. Thank so... You, Pat, friends, for doing that. Uh, if, if I understand, this agency has quite a, a management and administration effort to move forward with electronic filing, electronic systems, the IMS, the uh, and and if uh, you know we we need to. We've got these uh, components, rule makings, go to across the street, try and get our work done, H have this enormous uh, effort to get our staff uh, uh, educated and informed about how to adopt new systems. I think it's supportive of the staff to allow their proposal to go forward. It's it's kind of like the chicken and the egg question. Who's going to go for first? Who's? Uh, it's it's an effort to uh, try and bring modernization and um, effective uh, uh, systems 
and I think we need to support the staff. All right, Mary Beth, I know you're a pinch hitting this, this uh, morning, but you're also in the key position to uh, explain what I'm trying to get at. Uh, what What is the um, effort that's ongoing by the staff to bring uh, modern and effective uh, systems? And is this, uh, would it be helpful if we went ahead with this, even if we have to go with hat in hand across the street to get uh, some accommodation for it later? Could you comment further? Yes, sir. If the commission adopts this rule change, then in the future, there will not be a need for individual companies seeking to provide local exchange service to come to the commission when they file their application for CCN and say, what about notice? Please determine what notice should be. Because as you're aware, the commission has the ability to um, determine the notice requirements pursuant to its rules, but by the same token, they still have to interpret the statute when doing that. So this rule would eliminate the need to come in on a case-by-case -case basis and seek the termination of the notice to be given and how it should be delivered. I'm reminded of the, probably I shouldn't say this, of the uh, uh, fellow who, who was asked, have you ever heard of the, the game bureaucracy? Whoever makes the first move loses. You know, I think we need to try and be proactive and uh, move forward and streamline the regulatory process. Anyway, Mr. Hyatt, it's up to you. Uh, what's what's going to be the harm if we adopt this rule? They may not have perfect harmony with um, some statutory reading which can be worked out if it seems like we're trying to head in the right direction. The concern that I have is that, I mean, our rules have the effect of law once, once approved by the legislature and um, we would have, we would have uh, our rule that has the effect of law that would be in direct conflict with uh, the original statute, and and that's I I don't disagree uh, with anything, uh, Mary Beth. I totally agree with with the logic that uh, she's seeking, and I uh, agree, Commissioner Anthony. With uh, I wish it could be more streamlined, but I don't. I just don't know that we can completely ignore uh, the statute in rule. Now we have. I, I'm sure that I have. Um, Many times on a case by case basis, we've we've granted this, and it is an extra headache, and it's unfortunate. Uh, but we have we unfortunately have a statute that's probably outdated, and until it's updated, I don't know how we I don't know how we can change it. Okay, so your proposal is uh, on page 14. Uh, the small letter D is to omit that paragraph. Is that correct? Okay, I can uh, still uh, support it uh, with that change if that's your position. Um, I'd just like to add my comment. I appreciate what you've said, Commissioner Anthony and Mary Beth. I, I appreciate your comments as well. I, I just go back to my original opinion. I do not believe an agency can interpret mail to be email. And it's not an antiquity, it's, it's not an old provision that was changed. In fact, that provision, I don't have it right in front of me, but it was a recent change to add the mailing language. So I, that's why I think, uh, I believe as I understand it, that uh, Brandy has approached Mike Fina, who's head of OMPA, to see about making some adjustments to that to that language, because I'm not sure if they were the ones that had requested the language in the first place, but I just wanted to let everyone know some of the provisions in there were just recently changed within the last two years. Thank you. All right. Anything further? If not, uh, I'd like to consider the... Um, Sorry. 
It's agenda item number five. Okay. All right. If nothing further from the commissioner, we'll we'll uh, open up for public comment. I see that I have one registered that uh, may wish to make comment. And are there any others on the line that would like to make comment? Commissioner Hyatt, this is uh, Bud Ground with the Petroleum Alliance of Oklahoma. Yes, sir. I I believe that I registered to speak this morning on Chapter Five. Yes, you did. Oh, okay. Uh, is it is it uh, time now that you wanted me to speak? Y yes. Yes, please do. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, commissioners, while the Petroleum Alliance members are are do support the Chapter Five. Um, concept of, of having the electronic case filing system, we would like to reiterate that we still believe that it's a little premature to have rules for a, a a very robust system when there's actually nothing in place at this time to actually implement the electronic system or the guidance manual. And with so many moving parts, we, we very much believe that uh, it's very much open to unintended consequences, which could be worked out, and especially since you're going to have a paper system continue even with the electronic system. So we want to reiterate that. We do support it. We think it will very much uh, go towards modernizing the agency. And um, also want to say that on the user manual, that, that even though it is, you know, a guidance-type document, that we really ask that you treat it like a rule and have uh, public comment and, and engagement through the whole process because it, it seems to be uh, a very integral part of the whole, like I said, the, all the moving parts and how it's going to work together that we really hope that you include uh, industry and, and public comment in that. And uh, that's all I have as far as comments on Chapter 5. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Are there any others on the line that would like to make uh, public comment? Seeing none, I think we're ready to vote, and so we'll take up um, the proposed rules with exception of um, striking subsection D of uh, Part 5, Public Utilities. All right, we all on the same page? Okay. I would make the motion for oh. approval uh, as you just stated. All right, and I, and I think uh, it's okay, Mary Beth has a motion for us. I just forgot to call on her to ask yes. her to present that motion. Let's, Ms. I Snap, was... uh, would you please present the motion? I'm getting ahead of myself. Thank you. I ask that the commission make a motion to adopt the proposed rules as filed on March 16th, 2021, with the exception of paragraph D contained in OAC 165 5-7-53, Certificate of Convenience and Necessity in Service Territory Expansions for Providing Telecommunication Services, and with that omission of the proposed rules which were filed on March 16th, 2021, I'd ask that the commission incorporate in the record and the ensuing rule report all oral and written comments and documents filed with the court clerk regarding the rulemaking. I further ask that the commission allow JLS to make any changes necessary to be compliant with the requirements of the Office of Administrative Rules. Thank you. All right, you've heard the motion. Ms. Leatherrock, would you call the roll? Commissioner Hyatt? Aye. Commissioner Anthony? Aye. Commissioner Murphy? No. Um, I just wanted to explain my vote on no for all of Chapter 5. There are many things I support that are included in it, include what's done on the transportation in Oklahoma, uh, the uh, OSF. My concern was expressed at the very beginning of this process 
that I felt like we needed to go to pilot or beta testing before we rolled out such an extensive um, provision. I just want to appreciate the efforts made by the staff and more particularly, uh, Commissioner Hyatt, I think to your, to your aid and also to Terrell who worked very diligently with uh, Mary Beth and others and, and some in industry. I, I just conceptually do not support this path. I'm for the electronic filing. I think we need to move forward, but I think we need to try to work the kinks out before we roll out such an extensive plan. But again, I just wanted to express my appreciation for the efforts, and there are other provisions of Chapter 5 that I would support, but I didn't think it would be appropriate to try to piecemeal that, and just to make it easy, I'm just voting no. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, we'll turn to agenda item number six, 2021-3, uh, the chapter 10 rules. Ms. Conrad, are you on the line to present that? I, yes, I am, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Susan Conrad for the Commission's Ju Judicial and Legislative Services Division. We are here today for the public hearing in cause RM number 2021-0003, in the matter of a permanent rulemaking of the Oklahoma Corporation Commission amending OAC 165-10 oil and gas conservation. Uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking and proposed rules were filed in this cause on February 5, 2021. The notice of proposed rulemaking was published in the journal record on February 10, 2021 and in the Tulsa World on February 10, 2021. Uh, the Rural Impact Statement and the Economic Impact and Environmental Benefit Statement were filed in this cause on February 23, 2021. A technical conference regarding the Chapter 10 proposed rules took place on February 11, 2021. The Oil and Gas Conservation Division staff considered the comments made during the technical conference and the written comments regarding this rulemaking filed with the Commission's Court Clerk's Office. Uh, the Oil and Gas Conservation Division staff has also had meetings with industry representatives regarding the proposed rules. Proposed rules were filed in this cause on March 3rd, 2021, and also on March 16th, 2021, in response to comments received. For members of the public who are joining us remotely, if you would like to be included in the sign-in sheet for the hearing today regarding the Chapter 10 rules, please email your contact information to me by the end of the day today at susan.conrad, C-O-N-R-A-D, at occ.ok.gov, and please include in your email the name um, and uh, uh, of the entity or group that you're representing. For any members of the public who may be physically present in the courtroom, there's a sign-in sheet on the lectern, so please complete that sign-in sheet. Uh, commissioners, before you today for your consideration are proposed rules filed in this cause on March 16, 2021. Robin Strickland, Director of the Commission's Oil and Gas Conservation Division. Mike McGinnis, Deputy Director of the Division. Virginia Hollinger, Manager of the Division's Technical Services Department. And Duncan Woodless, Manager of the Division's Production Proration Department, are, are participating in this hearing and they are available for questions that you may have. After public comments are heard and if the Commission is so inclined, I have a motion uh, prepared to present for your consideration. Thank you, Susan. Questions of the Commissioners? All right. We'll open up. I see we have some that have registered uh, for public comment previously or any others that would be added to that. Uh, you're welcome to make public comment at this time. This is Katie Altschuler with Marathon Oil. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, excellent. Uh, just wanted to state for the record that we support the rules as proposed and just wanted to thank the commission staff and all of the corporation commissioners for working with industry to come up with a solution on the Chapter 10 rules for the administration of proration. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. 
Thank you. Are there others wishing to make public comment? Commissioner Murphy, I mean, Commissioner Hyatt, this is Bud Ground again with Strong Life of Oklahoma. Yes, Mr. Graham. I would like to um, also thank the staff for all the, the hard work they did to include industry. Um, and it wasn't just the Petroleum Alliance. It was it was all industry in the state, and it, it was um, very welcomed, and I, th I think we came out with a very good rule. So we, we do appreciate the work that the staff has done in being very inclusive and and coming coming up with a very good rule. Thank you. I know we all concur that um, staff has worked very hard. Bringing bringing the industry together is not always a, an easy <laughs> task. <laughs> so I also commend the staff. Are there others wishing to make public comment? Mr. Hyatt, this is Parker Bowles with the OEPA. Can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Bowles. I appreciate the time to, to speak with the staff and with the commission today. Uh, on behalf of OEPA, we also support the, the language and the rule as written. And we want to say thank you to not only the staff, but the members of the alliance and the industry that included us in part of the discussion of this rulemaking. Thank you. Others wishing to make public comment? Commissioner, hi, this is Shay Loper. Can you can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Loper. Uh, I so Shay Loper with Aventive. Uh, we we did submit a comment letter. Um, I, I would just like to echo the sentiments that have been raised already in, in support of the rule and, and thanking staff for for the uh, a really um, good and open process. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Others wishing to make public comment? Going once. All right. <laughs> I think that completes uh, public comment. Or are there further comments or questions of uh, the commissioners? Um, I just kind of echo what's already been said about the collaborative nature, probably one of the more collaborative efforts that we've seen um, uh, undertaken, and I really express appreciation. And I really want to, um, I usually don't do this, but I, I really think it's important to uh, do a shout out to Virginia. I know she's in the courtroom, but the meetings started some time back when I asked if she would try to coordinate some meetings early on before there was even uh, looking at the issue of the of the Chapter 10 rulemaking. And she undertook that and had many meetings, and then I think industry made some proposals. So the genesis of it, um, I think, can really be attributed to um, her efforts in trying to set up the meetings, and, and uh, I'm very appreciative. Virginia of you doing that. So I just wanted to mention that because there was a lot of uh, groundwork laid before we ever got to this place. And I felt like the person that helped move that along should be acknowledged. Thank you. Very well stated. I agree. Thank you. Yeah, I think it, uh, Virginia, is, am I right? The industry is usually shouting at you, not giving you a shout out. Is that <laughs> correct? So you'll take the shout out while you, while you can. All right. Anything further? Susan, I see nothing further from the public or the commissioners. Would you please present the motion? Yes, thank you. I ask the commission to make a motion to adopt the proposed rules filed with the court clerk's office on March 16th, 2021, incorporating in the record and in the ensuing rule report all oral and written comments and documents filed with the court clerk regarding this rulemaking. I further ask that the commission allow me to make any changes necessary to be compliant with the requirements of the Office of Administrative Rules. Thank you. You heard the motion. Seeing no further questions, Ms. Leatherrock, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Hyatt? Aye. Commissioner Anthony? Aye. Commissioner Murphy? Aye. 
Will there be any new business to come before the meeting? Seeing no new business, the meeting is adjourned. Okay. The meeting is about to terminate.